within the context of the spine world, yeah. what are the um, procedures that you personally okay. do, Mark? Fine. Well, I um, probably... I'm trying to think. I probably do some form of a injection-based intervention on about 25% of the patients I see in total. Okay. Um, it varies. Comes sometimes more, sometimes less, but about 25%. And what I do intervention-wise is, is stick needles in people, basically. Fair enough. Um, so everything from epidural injections yeah, so to so Everything and... from a trigger. So essentially, stick, you can either stick a needle in a muscle, you can stick it in the skin, in the subcutaneous, so the layers just under the skin. Yeah. You can stick a needle uh, around near a nerve. You can stick a needle into a joint. Or to, or to an area where there are lots of nerves, like an epidural space or yeah. a plexus. So all of those places will take a needle. And what you're delivering with that needle is either local anesthetic, steroid, or you're using some form of electricity through that needle. So, so you're sticking a needle in either skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle, around a nerve, into a group of nerves, or into a joint. Okay. And you're doing a collection of things. And you're either using your knowledge of anatomy or you're using ultrasound or you're using a thing called a fluoroscope, which is an X-ray machine sure. used in theatres, or you're using a CT scanner. So I use all of those modalities. I use needles in all of those places and I do all of those drugs. So it really varies, actually. I mean, probably 80% of my interventions are spinal based interventions. Okay. Um, I do a bit of Botox for, for migraines and Botox for muscle pain. Um, we do trigger points into muscles, particularly good after an acute whiplash where people got torticollis, that sort of thing. That can be really transformational in acute spasm. Um, but yeah, mostly spinal. So within the spine, you've got injections into joints. You've got As in facet joints? Yeah. Yep. So you've got the facet joints are either in the neck, the lumbar spine, or rarely in the thoracic spine. Yep. Um, you do um, injections to the nerves to the joints, which is a more diagnostic procedure, which is called the medial branch block. And that's to see if you switch off that joint, does the pain go? That's mm -hmm. quite a useful diagnostic tool. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll inject into the sacroiliac joint. Uh, some people have pain in the buttock over the sacroiliac joint and, and injections to those joints can be quite helpful. We'll do uh, an epidural and there's lots of different ways of doing an epidural. You can do an epidural from the side, you can do an epidural from the middle, you can do an epidural from underneath. There's a different reason for doing each one of those, it depends on how diagnostic you want to be. Um, you can do... Um, Procedures called radiofrequency and pulsed radiofrequency. I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to cover that now. Or... Uh, it, so so just, just for simple terms for the viewers of the Spine Exchange, uh, doing radiofrequency generally is where I'm assuming you burn the nerves. Yeah. Primarily around the facet Absolutely. joints, the medial branch. And, and, and I guess we'll perhaps talk later on what, where do we go next and we can sure. perhaps cover that. Sure. Then. Okay. So, Mark, very interesting. I, I, I get this question a lot. Yeah. People say, Joel, why should I have an injection? Doesn't it just mask the pain? Yeah. And can it not actually uh, make things worse for me? So in other words, I won't be able to feel the pain. I go back to the gym or I go back to my sport and I could potentially do more damage to my spine while this medication is actually masking the pain. Yeah. What's your thought on that, Mark? It's a, that's a, a valid point. Yeah. Um, and uh, every person's journey is, is different. Um, if you've got a professional weightlifter who uh, gets a disc prolapse and wants to compete, that's a very difficult um, question. Do you give them an epidural? You know, this is potentially their one shot at, at greatness and that's a very difficult decision. So very rarely you meet a situation where you're back is against the wall and you mm. have to make that decision. But mm. that's very unusual. Mm. Normally, 
you're dealing with someone who is under a level of supervision. Um, I often say to people, if you've got an acute disc prolapse leading to sciatica, then avoid impact and significant weight lifting probably for the first three months. Um, and then from when your story starts, because the right. disc is quite brittle for three months and then it starts to... Uh, once it starts to heal, it gets less brittle. But I think you need to avoid significant activity uh, because, yes, potentially you could do some harm. But, but as long as you're doing your activity in a controlled way, it's very unlikely. I think it's where people don't listen or people are in a position where they could do more harm. I think you know people are operating uh, vibrating machinery, people jumping out of aeroplanes, you know, people lifting serious weights, then, then yes, potentially there is harm. Yeah. But for everyone else, absolutely not. And the thing about pain is very often the pain's the problem and it's not actually telling you anything that helpful. It's, it's, it's causing more problems than it's, it's preventing. Right. And, and we talk a lot about fear avoidant behavior. And we talk uh, a lot about altered movement dynamics caused by pain and people end up causing themselves all sorts of problems because they're compensating for the pain all you've got to do is see a dog walking when it's got a thorn in its paw it sure. lifts the paw and it's hopping along on the other three legs sooner or later those three legs are going to come <laughs> a cropper aren't they and we and we all do that you know we we change how we mm. function because of the pain and you cause all sorts of problems by doing that and i think you prevent a lot more difficulty by treating the pain than you cause by treating the pain. But you just have to give people sensible advice about what they can do after an intervention. And the important thing is, is that pain very often does not equal harm. Mm. And masking the pain is a good idea, mm. unless you're a masochist. <laughs> Fair enough. But also, I think, Mark, it's... it's, it's um valid to point out that having an injection will not numb the pain to a point of where if you do potentially put yourself in a harmful situation, yeah. your brain and your spinal cord is going to override yeah. any medication that's yeah. swirling around in your body. Oh no, absolutely. And you, 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 know. you really, there's, there's a, there are, if you're going to have an operation where they're going to chop your arm off, you can numb those nerves and have your arm chopped off, but within pain medicine, that's not how it no, plays. No. You know, we're much more reliant on things working just to modulate that process rather than get rid of it. So, yeah, yeah that's a fair point. Thank yeah, you yeah, for yeah. Okay. making it. Good, that's fair enough. Mark, many people approach me and they say, uh, Joel, if I have these injections, I've heard or I've read that the injections may only work for three weeks, in some instances, they may work for three months and then I've got to go back and repeat them over and over again, yeah. regardless of whether it's for the facet joint or a caudal epidural for a central disc or whatever it is. And <clears throat> clinically, I've seen, Mark, that in certain instances, I've sent people off to uh, professionals that have administered injections and we are a year, 18 months down the line and these patients are still pain-free. So can injections alleviate pain indefinitely? What's, what's the varying yeah. degrees? There are a number of different reasons for doing an injection. Mm. Um, one of the, probably one of the primary reasons is people quite often want to know why they're in pain mm. um, and want to know whether there's something that can be done. So I think you, the, as long as you manage expectations appropriately, I think a diagnostic injection can be really quite helpful. Um, and I think that it, uh, that's where managing expectations is important. There aren't that many injections that are purely diagnostic, but there are some. Um, now, if you have somebody who presents with back pain, and it's quite a mixed picture, you know that there's an element of muscular dysfunction, you know they may have a bit of disc degeneration or even a bit of disc prolapse on their MRI scan. You know that they've got a degree of wear 
in some of the joints in their back on the MRI scan, or when you examine them, it's highly suggestive of joint pain. But it's very difficult to un unpick all of that. And that's where injections can be quite helpful. Very often, I will say to people, looking at you, 80% of your pain is muscular. I really do think you either haven't been doing physio or you've been approaching your exercise in the wrong way, and I do think that needs to be addressed, and I think that's your dominant issue, and I'll send people away. Um, but if they've kind of gone through that gambit, or if clinically they look very much like it's a joint problem, then we'll quite often do a diagnostic injection okay. to say, look, we just need to know. And if you do that, you numb the joint with a drug which lasts 12 hours, 18 hours, and you have a chat with them in a week or two, say, what happened? And they've just got to remember what happened. And, and if they say, well, my pain completely went, for the day, then you that's know. quite powerful, mm -hmm. and then you know what you're dealing with, and you can you can go on to treat that. So I think that very often you don't want the injection to last. Very often there's a very specific reason for doing something that lasts for a short period of time. And then you have people who are stuck, yeah, and they want to be able to move, and you look at their movement pattern, and it's really quite abnormal. And if you can get them moving naturally and normally again often their pain won't come back. And if you think a little bit about the way the facet joint works, mm. it's a really small movement. And, and particularly down at the bottom, and that tiny little pelvic movement, and very often that's where the pain is. Yes. And if you can get that joint in sense it for a period of time, get rid of the pain from that joint for a period of time, then they can work with someone, get those movements back, and then those muscles will sort of return yes. to, to normal bulk over the period of two to three months. And then when the injection wears off, they're actually okay. Right. So that's the, that's the group who will do really well. So if they're in a decent program of movement-based program and they've got a, kind of a couple of joints that are a bit stuck, very mm. often they'll just turn the corner. And, and you, we all know of people who've had tennis elbow or, or, a, 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 or a rotator cuff or, or, or a, even a Jupitrons and they've had a little jab and the pain's just gone, you mm. know. And, and a lot of times you don't know why it does, but it just does. just does. But if you think about the biomechanics of the facet joint, you can kind of see why, if you can get that moving, why that pain wouldn't come back. Right. Um, and the other thing is, as I say to, if I'm doing a steroid-based a joint injection like that. And I'll say to people, you've got a, I don't know, 30 or 40% chance that we're going to need to do something else. And historically, what would happen is people would just come back and back and back. And it was just awful practice because you're not doing anything really. You're just, you're just sort of keeping, keeping things ticking along. And that really doesn't help them long term. And that's when we develop uh, radio frequency de-innovation. Got so you. if people have stubborn joint-based pain that won't go, what you do is you can heat up and treat the nerves that go to those joints. Absolutely. And if you, if you approach the joint in the right way, if you approach the nerve obliquely with a decent-sized needle with a proper curve on it, you can get three or four years. So there's a real variation in outcome from radio frequency denervation depending upon the technique. And the technique's really changed in the last 20 years. So right. if, you, if you do that well, you can, you know, I saw, I saw a lady today, actually, who um, I last treated her left side of back pain three years ago. And before that, she'd seen a colleague of mine five years ago for the right side, and she came back today, and she's got her right side wow. of pain back. Okay. So it doesn't happen very often. I'd say 25% of people will come back for a repeat denervation. It does happen. Got you. And you want it to be three, five years and you often find people actually as they get older those joints sort of fuse yeah and yeah. once they fuse then the pain pain, stops. pain's gone uh, something has occurred to me and I, i'd love your your viewpoint on this and hopefully it's uh, beneficial for the viewers as you know i've uh, i always like to say i've been the recipient of seven spine surgeries oh. um and on my last surgery mark um it was, it was extremely painful. All of them were painful. But this was, on the seventh surgery, it was surgical site pain. Right. It wasn't any neural pain. The neural pain that I experienced previously, which was a, a, a nerve sheath um, stretch injury, that had settled. Thank God that settled. 
Um, anyway, on the seventh surgery, um, it was surgical site pain uh, inflammation because we used uh, a certain bone graft, which uh, is BMP. So you, you're naturally going to get a lot of inflammation. And because of the past surgeries, I was very uh, wary of pain medication, specifically any opioid-based medication. And what I wanted to try and do was, post the surgery, was to not use any pain-reducing medication. And I was actually advised against that. And the person who advised me um, said, Joel, they, 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 they're, uh, they're very, um, uh, uh, their expertise is in neurodynamics and nerves. And I, he advised me, he said, don't try and brave this. Take the pain medication because, as you know, if the pain gets set into your central nervous system, even when everything is settled down and the inflammation is gone, that pain can still be there and that, that loop can play over and over again. Mm. Mark, has that got legs to it? Is there... Yeah, I mean, I think that, that in a way, what you're talking about there is the development of chronic pain. Yes. And chronic pain is a multifactorial entity okay. that has a variety of different risk factors. And it's undoubtedly true that persistent, intractable, poorly treated post-surgical pain is a risk factor. And that's what they were talking about. Absolutely. Um, it's only one risk factor, but it is a risk factor. Yeah. And I think... And that, I listened to him because <laughs> I've got immense respect for him, by the way. And I think that... that in a way, what you would, and I, 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 I don't want to jump to conclusions, but you know, you, you, know, you were traumatized. You know, you'd been through oh, yeah. seven surgeries, and you'd also experienced what it was like when you're taking a drug that's not really working. It's giving an awful lot of side effects, and then you've got to try and come off it, and that's pretty scary. Place. It was terrible, and and that's. You know, that, that, that's something that I see on a daily basis. Mm. And helping people off medication and making them understand that it's, you know, we've been there before, we know how to do this. You know, you've just got to manage it, you've got to manage side effects, you've just got to manage expectation, you've got to communicate. And, and, and you can get people off meds. And, and I think that you were well advised and you were hopefully well supported and guided to come off them. So yes. you, you know, half the battle sometimes is getting people on them, but then half the battle sometimes is getting people off yeah. as well. But yeah. yes, undoubtedly, uncontrolled pain for a prolonged period of time is a significant risk factor for the development of long-term pain. Long -term yeah. pain. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Mark, there's been so much talk, um, and again, I've, I'm asked this on a weekly basis. What's the use of stem cells with regards to disc herniations and back pain and uh, PRP and all these different types of uh, interventions. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I um, like to consider that my practice is governed by evidence. Okay. The spine is enormously difficult because... There's so many components to why people have pain, and we're all different. And so actually to organize a properly structured randomized controlled trial into what works for back pain is very, very difficult. Yeah. And I think one has to be quite mindful of that when one's overly critical of, of new techniques. And I remember, I mean, the holy grail for back pain, in some respects, is, is sort of disc pain. Mm. So discogenic pain, mm. black disc disease, mm. call it what you will. And there is a pretty significant school of thought that, do, that considers that the lumbar intervertebral disc is a considerable, is an important pain generator. Mm. Mm. And we're always on the lookout for something new that will help. You'll be aware that um, 
a recently retired surgeon close to me is very heavily involved in the possibility of intradiscal antibiotics, mm -hmm. which is a very exciting area. And there's a lot of evidence to support that, both from the use of oral antibiotics and also some lab work that's been done. So I sure. think that's really quite promising. And I think that's, that's new therapy, which I think for a small subset of back pain sufferers will be potentially transformative. Yes, yes. Um, we looked within the pain world about 15, 20 years ago at free, rad free radical scavenging yeah. in, in disc disease. And there was a really good, or promising, exciting study that came out of Israel in the use of methyl in blue. Yes. Um, and it was amazing results. The study got repeated. No one ever got the same results. And I think you have to remember with studies that that you've got a about one in 20 chance of mm. getting a false positive, mm -hmm. with, you know, the way that the statistics are structured. So one positive result is you've got a one in 20 chance of being a complete lie. Yeah. And I suspect that's what this was. So new exciting things get us all excited for good reason. And at the moment, if you look at, for example, PRP, there's a logic to it. Um, what PRP is, is it's your own blood yes. spun, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> concentrated goodness. And it's the same as what the body does. But it's, uh, and actually it's pretty safe because all you're doing is you're taking it out of a vein, you're spinning it down and you're sticking it back in someone. So you're actually yes. not giving them anything. Yeah. So actually, what a good idea. But the evidence to support it, not great. Yeah. You know, is it better than acupuncture? Is it better than a trigger point injection? Is it better than a massage? Nobody really knows, yeah. but it's completely safe as long yeah. as you don't introduce infection. So I think PRP has a role, but there's a good evidence to support it. Not really. Yeah. Stem cells. Are, stem cells are really interesting, and I think that in the next 20 years, I think we're going to see a lot of aspects of of medicine being transformed by stem cell therapy. Um, we're not there yet, no. and there is no evidence that stem cells in the spine or in the back help. Mm. Uh, there's plenty of anecdotes, um, but anecdotes, a collection of anecdotes is an evidence. Um, and we are all very, we all have observer bias. Yeah, um, very and, much so. And, and I think that the other thing is the more you spend, the more likely you are to want it to succeed. Yeah. So expensive therapy is a great placebo. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I mean, I put it this way, I wouldn't spend my money on it. I'd rather buy a second-hand car or go on a nice <laughs> holiday, really. I think, I, think it, I, 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 I think it's a waste of money. That's yeah. my personal view. Yeah. I think there's really exciting stuff around the corner. Yes. But we're not there we're yet. We're just not there yet. Mm. Mark, you've said so many wise things during this time. No, you have, really. It's very informative and, and very beneficial, um, I'm sure, to, to the viewers and, and to myself as well. But um, just to end off, any words of wisdom for the viewers of the Spine Exchange? I think that what I often think about when I'm talking to patients is... Sometimes you need to take a step back and look at your wider position. And I think that very often they come thinking that their problem is the pain. And actually, it's what the pain's doing to them that's the problem. You know, they stop seeing their friends. They've stopped talking to their wife. Mm -hmm. They're not sleeping. Um, their work's affected. They're not going to the gym, they're not exercising, they're not going fishing, they're grumpy. All of these things. And actually, what you have to do each day is you have to introduce a little bit of happiness into your life. Mm. Because ultimately, all we really want is to be happy. Yeah. And the pain is stopping us being happy. And actually, the only way to change that is to start doing things that bring you happiness. Um, and, and then that helps you see things differently. 
Dr. Mark Alexander-Williams, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Sure, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.